joined with Dr. Nick Walker, who is a professor of somatic psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. She's the, the genius mind behind the, the book, Euroqueer Heresies. Uh, we're going to dive into that term in a little while. Uh, but Nick, for people who aren't familiar with you or your work, give us a little bit of background about how you became an educator, how you became an author, and did, did you always see your life uh, going the way that it has as an, as an author and an educator? <laughs> I certainly did not. I certainly did not see my life uh, going in, in this direction at all. No, no. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I grew up, uh, you know, uh, autistic, but not knowing I was autistic. I grew up in uh, deep, deep poverty. And so uh, was not, you know, was not from the sort of background where kids get uh, recognized as autistic early on or anything like that. And, um, or the sort of background where kids go to college. So that, that was not something I thought was in the cards for me, not where I thought my life was headed. And I didn't, uh, uh, a lot of my work, though, draws on uh, being uh, involved in, you know, street level queer activism as uh, a teen and young adult. So that was growing up uh, queer in the uh, in the USA in the 80s, you know, in the, the Ronald Reagan era. Uh, there was definitely some, uh, you know, take it, take it to the streets, queer activism there that, uh, and that has informed my approach to neurodiversity related work and neuroqueer theory and such. So I kind of came to academia with more of a, uh, take it to the streets, um, radicalized understanding of, uh, of the world and of human diversity and difference and what was necessary in order for liberation to happen. And so I brought that into my academic work. I didn't start going to college until I was uh, in my thirties and okay. really was certainly not expecting to go all the way. I actually started going to college with this expectation that I would just, you know, get an associate of arts degree to be able to actually go make a decent living for the first time in my life. And it just kind of kept going because it, I was surprised to discover that I was good at academia. Yeah. And so all of that was a surprise. I was teaching from early on. I've been uh, training in Aikido since I was 12. And so I've been teaching Aikido since my late teens. And uh, so I came into academia, um, you know, not expecting to be a professor, but already with uh, having spent my whole adult life teaching groups of people. So uh, that transition- You were just a natural teacher. Yeah, that I, I mean, I think I was, I had good teachers in Aikido and sort of modeled how to work with groups. And so I came into academia with that sense of uh, already feeling comfortable getting up in front of a group of people and facilitating the learning process. Fantastic. And, and yeah. would you would you say that you were always there was always a writer inside you from from a young age? Yes, there was always a storyteller. I I was slow to write because of autistic uh, you know dys dyspraxia issues, fine motor coordination issues. So I actually physically, um, you know, I grew up in this era, you know, where if you were growing up poor, you didn't have access to keyboards and computers and and such. You know that that wasn't really a, that wasn't really a thing. I didn't own a computer until my my late twenties, and so um, you know it was all handwriting, and I couldn't I couldn't do that. I couldn't actually uh, write legible letters uh in my in my childhood i was about 12 i think before i could actually write a sentence out so i didn't expect to be a writer but i did draw a lot and i actually thought um <clears throat> you know i thought i wanted to i wanted to do comics and 
now in my middle age, I actually do in fact uh, uh, write a web comic, but uh, I'm collaborating with a, an artist because I'm out of the drawing habit. But as a child, I drew all the time. And that was a, um, uh, a storytelling medium for me. And so I think I was always interested in storytelling and narrative. And I see my academic work that way. I see all my neurodiversity related work, my work on neuroqueer theory as um, being about changing the narrative, creating a better narrative for us. So yeah, that's always been there for me. Diving into that, that term. So I had never heard of the term neuroqueer before. So for people who like me might not have heard this term, can you give us a definition or multiple definitions of what this might mean to, to people? Yes, well, I'm gonna point, uh, <clears throat> gonna point people <clears throat> excuse me, towards my book, I think, is, is where, uh, mm, because in the final section of my book, I do write about it at, uh, at length, and it is, but uh, yeah, it is a relatively new concept that's, uh, to my surprise, is, is, has been catching on really fast, which is one of the reasons I decided to, to put a book together. Um, but we have this idea in queer theory that um, heteronormativity is this compulsory performance, meaning that uh, this binary binary genders and what we think of as you know masculine and feminine behavior and heterosexuality and such these are all these are learned ways of behaving. These are learned performances, and so we're uh, aggressively you know, conditioned from childhood. We're assigned uh, uh, a binary gender role based on the shape of our genitalia. You know, you're a boy, you're a girl, and then trained into this, like, oh, this is how, this is how boys do things. This is what boys do. Boys don't cry, boys are tough. You know, girls do this. And, you know, heterosexuality, of course, is a big uh, part of that conditioning. And so that is a whole heteronormative conditioning, but it is uh, a learned and conditioned performance rather than, uh, you know, and it's so, so the dominant societal mindset is that, oh, this is natural. You know, if you listen to <clears throat> homophobes and transphobes, you know, they're always saying, oh, this, this is, uh, you know, any deviation from heteronormative binary gender roles is unnatural. But of course, if it were actually, uh, if, these, if this heteronormativity was actually natural, it wouldn't take so much work to impose it on people and enforce it all the time. And so the idea, you know, is uh, with kind of queerness is you can queer heteronormativity, you know, meaning you can subvert it, you can deviate from it, subvert it, undermine it, liberate yourself from it, change how you're performing your gender, stop doing heterosexuality if it's not working for you. There's this, so, so queering <clears throat> in a sense in, in queer theory uh, is, is a, a verb. You know, and then it also, of course, an adjective. We talk about the queer community, but you're queer because you you are in in how you live. You are queering heteronormativity. You are uh, deviating from this straight and narrow path that uh, society tries to force you onto. And so, um, so the idea with neuroqueer theory is just essentially expanding queer theory to encompass. Uh, the realm of neurodiversity and say, well, heteronormativity is deeply, inextricably entwined with neuronormativity. And when you think about what it means when someone is uh, trained in childhood to act like a normal boy or a normal girl, that's a, a neurotypical boy or girl, as well as like a heterosexual, heteronormative boy or girl. And so uh, this neuronormative performance is also is entwined with the heteronormative performance and can also be queered. And autistic people are in a sense, you know, 
neurocognitively queer, you know, uh, any any neuro minority group, autistic people, uh, you know, is has always been you know my community. But any 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 neurodivergent person is, in a sense, uh, unless they're desperately trying to mask uh, who they really are, they are queering neuronormativity. And so this idea that neuronormativity and heteronormativity are entwined, they can both be queered and to queer one ultimately is to queer the other. That if you're, if you are embodying your autistic self, for instance, you're no longer really doing heteronormativity in the conventional way either. And if you're fully queering heteronormativity, you're no longer, you know, building the neural pathways around uh, heteronormativity. So you're 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 starting to deviate from neuronormativity as well. So yeah, that's the uh, the basics. And like I say, it's it's. Uh, it's complex and interesting and has a lot of potential and I, I, I'm loving how it's taking off and where people are taking it. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense when you describe it like that. Uh, so hopefully we'll see it in the, uh, the dictionary soon, eh? I, I hope so. We'll see. I mean, I certainly, you know, uh, 20 years ago when I first got involved in uh, autistic community and autistic activism, I did not expect to see, you know, neurodiversity and neurotypicality in, in the dictionary, but there they are now. And um, one more question I wanted to ask you was, when, when were you, when did you find out that you were autistic? Because it was quite late in life, wasn't it? Yeah, I knew, uh, I always knew that uh, my, my mind didn't work like other people's. I always knew I was different and I uh, shocked most of it up to queerness and various sorts and to not, you know, uh, um, and it, it was, uh, you know, I was, I was misdiagnosed in various ways by, you know, as a child and all, you know, had to have a, quite the collection of exciting childhood misdiagnoses. When I was a kid, you know, again, uh, uh, unless you your family was affluent and you had access to real state of the art diagnostic services, you probably weren't going to get diagnosed as autistic uh, in childhood back when I was a kid, unless you were non speaking. I was actually uh, non speaking about half the time, but because I could speak some of the time, people assumed that I was um, uh, just choosing not to speak the rest of the time, and. Which of course, if you've actually had a conversation with me, you know I never choose not to speak. But, <laughs> but, you can't but shut you up. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so yeah, I didn't actually figure out I was autistic until I was working as a uh, reading tutor and working with autistic kids and realizing that they they moved like me and that I had this uh, unusual rapport with them, and uh, so that that led me to seek out assessment. And um, where can we find your book online in bookstores near you? Where is it available? Oh yeah, yeah, anywhere it is widely available, which is which is great because you know, uh, again, twenty years ago, you know, uh, a book like this, you know, by a queer autistic person, it would be this very obscure fringe thing, and it would be hard to find some sort of like underground self-published zine, zine thing or something like that. But no, you can like, you know go awesome. into a bookstore and order my book, get it from Amazon, Amazon UK, if you're in the UK, Waterstones, if you're in the UK, it's yeah. just anywhere where books are sold, it's, it's there. Fantastic. Sounds good. I'm going to pick up a copy. Um, oh, yeah. I was going to ask you what we can expect from your Ithacom talk next year, but it's all about neuroqueer theory. And I think you've just summed it up perfectly without giving oh, too much you. away, right? Yeah, and I don't know exactly what I'm going to say. What I what I told uh, the the organizers when they you know asked me, um, I said you know I'm going to uh, record the talk uh, fairly last minute, and I'll talk about whatever is on interesting me most at the time. And my own views and my work is constantly evolving. So I I am excited to find out what I'm going to speak about because I don't know. Uh, what the what the edge of my work will be by that time. I love the fact that even you don't know what you're going to talk about. So I'm even more <laughs> excited to hear your talk next year in March. 
Uh, where can we find out more about you if people want to check you out? Are you on social media? Um, yes. What is the name of your web series, your web comic? Ah, great. Okay, so I have for more for more on my neuroqueer theory and neurodiversity related work, I'm at neuroqueer.com. And then there's links there to social media, you know, my Facebook page and my Twitter accounts. And I'm pretty active on, on Twitter these days. And so yeah, neuroqueer.com for information on that. And then the web comic is called Weird Luck. You can find that easily. You know, I think a simple Google search turns us up really easily now. Okay, cool. We'll yes. be sure to check that out. I'll leave all your links in the description and people can check more um, out about you. Nick, thank you so much for joining me today, this evening or this oh, morning. Thank in you. The it's States. been a pleasure. Lovely yes. to meet you and uh, see you soon.